Good morning, everyone. We'll get started for today, wrapping up some naming uh, stuff from chapter two. This particular slide, um, I added an extra slide. I wanted to make sure to get a couple things into words here. This slide's in lecture slides at the very bottom is just an extra PDF in case you're looking for the slide. The rest of the slides will be the remaining notes from chapter two. But I wanted to make sure that we say this out loud, that ionic compounds are charge neutral compounds. You know, so that we were talking about this last time that if we're going to have a compound, say, in a bottle, we're gonna ship that bottle across the country, that chemical that, that's in the bottle has to be charge neutral. If we have a net buildup of positive or negative charge, we can't just bottle sulfate ion. We have to pair it up with something positive um, to balance out the charge. So ionic compounds are charge neutral compounds. And then we express their formulas as the simplest ratio of their ions. And so we look at the underlying ions and try to think the simplest whole number ratio of those ions um, give us the formula. And sometimes, I don't really like this lingo, but occasionally you'll see a test question that says something like, give the empirical formula of the compound with the name blah, blah, blah. Like for example, give the compound's formula, empirical formula with the name iron three carbonate. The use of the word empirical there is just really saying, give that simplest ratio, give the formula for the compound. So the formula for something like iron three carbonate, hopefully you see that this is really pretty easy because iron three plus is just this. The three is indicating the charge on iron. It's not telling you how many irons there are in the formula. It's not telling you how many carbonates there are. It's just specifically telling you what the charge state is of iron. Iron's in the middle of the transition metal block. The transition metals, they have a variety of charge states um, that are possible and common for those metals. And we don't wanna go through the effort of memorizing all those because they're kind of random. Like if you notice iron is, um, it's sort of eight over from the noble gas count. It rarely forms the iron eight plus. In fact, that's not a common ion of iron. So it's really hard to predict what charge states those ions will have and how many different charge states are possible or common within the metal. But for this part of the chapter, we're just trying to understand, can I give you the name and then we can express the formula? Can I give you a formula and then we can write the name? We're not trying to say, can you predict what the charge is for these transition metals? Just name to formula, formula to name is the goal. So now iron three plus is iron carbonate. We have to memorize or just know that it's CO3 with a two minus charge. We just have to know that. Now knowing the two charges here, whenever these are imbalanced, meaning whenever I have an odd and an even number and I can't just easily figure out how many of the one there are relative to the other, what I can easily do is just do one of these cross multiplications and give the formula two irons and then parentheses around the carbonate, three carbonates. And then what I'm doing here is I'm balancing out my six plus and my six minus. So when I add up the collective charges of all the ions in one of the units of this compound in the formula, that it ends up being charge neutral. So I need to be charge neutral for the compound and I am if it has the um, formula Fe2CO3-3. And that also is the simplest ratio. I wouldn't wanna give Fe4CO3-6. You know, I wouldn't wanna double these because that wouldn't be the simplest ratio. So we wanna get the simplest ratio. Uh, now, how do we name something like FeO? So FeO, we now look at oxide is the, the, the ion of O here is O2 minus. We can predict certain groups of elements as charge. We can predict the alkali always have to be plus one when they're forming ionic compounds. The alkaline, the second group, the magnesium, calcium, strontium group have to be plus two. And that's just getting us to that noble gas count of electrons, the halogens, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, and ion form, those are minus one. So Periodic table placement for certain groups is possible, but for other groups like the transition metals, not as easy. So oxygen's in the group with sulfur, where they commonly form ions with that two minus charge, really only with this two minus charge. And so based on oxygen's charge, we can deduce that the charge on iron has to be two plus. Now this cross multiplication of charges that we just did for Fe, uh, three plus CO3, two minus, that works when I know the charges. It's a little bit harder to take the coefficients and go back. So I don't wanna look at Fe and O and say, well, it's one to one, so the charges have to be plus one and minus one. I don't necessarily wanna go backwards with the charges. It doesn't really work as easy that way. If I know the charges, I would cross multiply if they were odd even. Two plus, two minus, I don't cross multiply because that would give me uh, a, a non-empirical formula. So I don't want to write the formulas Fe2O2. That doesn't make the simplest ratio. FeO is the simplest ratio. And so now what's the charge of iron here? Two plus. So that's iron two. So just simply iron two and then oxide is the ion name. 
The good news is you don't have to do spelling on the test. The, the naming is always multiple choice. Some math questions will be numerical entries. Some math questions on your test will be, you have to like type in the, the mathematical answer. And when you see those questions, there's, uh, when I put the practice tests up, you can go through a Carmen exam and see that there's a few questions that will be like that on your practice test. And, and you will be told, enter a number to like the tenths place, to the nearest tenths place. And you can enter an answer, hit enter, and then move on to the next question. But the naming questions, I think it's good to know from your vantage point that you don't have to worry about spelling these names. You just have to worry about recognizing the names from like a list from a multiple choice set of answers. Um, okay, so the um, compounds for ionic compounds are always just the cation name followed by the anion name. So notice that we're not calling iron three carbonate diiron tricarbonate. We don't need to use the dies and the tries in the names because the charges indicate the quantity. So we just have to understand from the name, we get the charges. From the charges, that's how we get the ratio of these ions. So when I say sodium hypochlorite, I'm just thinking, well, this has to be an ionic compound because it's metal and a collection of non-metallic atoms. And so sodium plus is the only possible charge state for sodium. And then hypochlorite, I kind of think this perhaps first, that that's chlorate. And then this would be chlorite. And then having just one oxygen would be hypochlorite. So sodium hypochlorite, has this formula here, NaClO. And then it's one to one because I have plus one minus one. And so the formula here would be NaClO. And this is the main ingredient in bleach. So this is actually a fairly commonly used uh, compound. So sodium hypochlorite, frequently used. Okay, so with this, let's head into, you know, back into the notes where, we're, where we were at last time. And we were just naming acids last time. If you recall, acid nomenclature kind of goes like this. If you can imagine something like iodide, have an H plus ion added onto it that makes for a molecular compound. And then the molecular compound's name, uh, predominantly when it's in water, and we'll talk about the reactions of these compounds in water in chapter four in more detail to understand this, but these compounds behave as acids in water, meaning they're gonna release the H plus ion into water. That's what makes something really behave as an acid. Um, but then we call this thing HI, we'd call this hydroiodic acid. Then if we had something like H, um, um, let's do H2SO4. So we have sulfate, and now sulfate's a two minus, so it took two hydrogens to balance the charge. This would be sulfuric acid. So the original ion, if it ends in eight, goes to ic acid. If the original ion ends in ide, it goes to hydroic acid, so hydroiodic acid. And so the nomenclature system is kind of looking at the acid, seeing the underlying ion that's you know, related to the acid or that it's derived from, and then naming accordingly. If I have H2SO3, just to give a reminder from what we were looking at last time, this is sulfite, and ite ions go to OUS acid. So this would be sulfurous. So sulfur OUS acid. So sulfurous acid. Sulfuric acid for H2SO3 for sulfurous, H2SO4 for sulfuric. Okay, so just reminding ourselves of some of the um, acid nomenclature from last time, just a couple quick examples there. And so then an acid, let's say of carbonate. So carbonate would take two H pluses. And remember H plus or H3O plus, that's what we would term hydronium ion. Probably not commonly on the test of H3O plus or H plus, but that's thinking of a dissolved H plus ion in water, you can add on to carbonate. And then that gives you carbonic acid, H2CO3. And so carbonate, the acid of it, carbonic acid, which is eight to ic acid. And so this is the same basic nomenclature that we were seeing for sulfuric acid. And so what if we though have carbonate just react with one H plus and it just ends up forming this ion here where it's HCO3 with a minus charge. How do we name that ion? Well, notice that HCO3 minus isn't charge neutral. So when we think of nomenclature, I name acids as acids when they're charge neutral. So acids are gonna be charge neutral compounds. Now, that doesn't mean, that if you get real technical, if you say, well, it's HCO3 minus, is that an acid? Maybe you learned, if you had a really good AP class, you might've learned that there's you know, a Ka for HCO3 minus, and it will dissolve and form carbonate in solution, and that makes um, HCO3 minus a weak base or excuse me, a, a weak acid in water. So HCO3 minus is a, an acid, it has an acid property. You may know this, you may not know that, I don't know. 
But in terms of nomenclature, we're still looking at it having a charge. So I'm looking at this charge here and saying, I'm gonna name it still for being an ion. So I see that minus charge still. I'm just gonna name it like it's still an ion. And if carbonate, CO3, two minus, I've added a hydrogen to carbonate. I've dropped the charge from two minus to minus as a result. I call this hydrogen carbonate. So the nomenclature would go HCO3 minus is hydrogen carbonate. Old, old books call this bicarbonate. If your book in high school still called this bicarbonate, that's a super old book. It's been called hydrogen carbonate for over 25 years now. Um, but the, the, the official name of HCO3 minus is the hydrogen carbonate ion. And then this can go for other ions. So if you think of any ion that has anion, any anion that has a two minus or three minus charge can absorb an H plus or two H pluses and still have a charge. So we would still name those as ions. So to go through this with phosphate. So we have phosphates, PO4, three minus. So you add one hydrogen to phosphate, then we end up with hyd uh, hydrogen phosphate. So hydrogen phosphate, one hydrogen added to the formula phosphate. Notice that the charge drops by one unit. Drop the charge again by another unit by adding a second H plus ion. So H2, PO4 with a minus charge. That would be dihydrogen because we have two hydrogens for phosphate. So this is a topic of compounds that's commonly not on the test, but it is in the book and it is important. These are examples of compounds you'll see and use in the lab. So I think it's important that we understand where the names are being derived for these types of ions. And so where you see these are in things like KHCO3 is a fairly common compound because this is potassium, that's easy. And then this whole ion here is hydrogen carbonate. So the name of this compound here would be potassium hydrogen carbonate. And then hydrogen carbonate is the entire name of that ion. So we're still fitting into the whole nomenclature of cation and ion name. Okay, so let's get into some organic compounds that get into some, some uh, molecules that'll lead towards some things you'll see in OCHEM later. So we're just gonna broach the topic of naming a couple of different classes of compounds that we um, think of as being organic. Organic is generally carbon-containing compounds. Um, carbon and hydrogen very commonly uh, occurring elements in these compounds. And so the simplest organic compounds are going to be the saturated hydrocarbons. And so if you saturate one carbon by saturating, I mean carbon can form four bonds. So CH4 maximizes the number of hydrogens you can get onto one carbon atom. So that's our saturated hydrocarbon with one carbon. If we connect two carbons together, um, and then we can get three carbons onto each of the carbons so that carbon, each of the carbons has a total of four bonds. So carbon's capable of forming four bonds, one of them's with the other carbon atom, so it has three spots left over for hydrogen. If you wedge another carbon in, you have C3, then you have room for CH3s, CH3s on the end, but only two hydrogens in the middle. So we might express the formula for propane as CH3, CH2, CH3. So your CH3s on the end, you can get CH2s in the middle, and it's all about having four total bonds per carbon as your max. And so that's what we call saturated hydrocarbons. And so the nomenclature system is one, um, one carbon's methane. I think we know this, it's a pretty common compound. Same thing with ethane. Uh, propane versus butane is usually a confusing point. Propane, I don't know, this is what Hank Hill's selling in King of the Hill. It's the C3 compound. It's the next one after ethane. So propane has three carbons and then butane is the next with four. So butane's formula would have four carbons and you can imagine just having a maximum of three uh, hydrogens on the end for four bonds for the first carbon, CH2 for the middles and then CH3 for the end. We could also express the formula for butane as CH3, CH2, CH2. We can also put it all together, like C2H6 for ethane, C3H8 for propane, and it ends up being C4H10 for butane. So some questions on a test might be, what's the formula for butane? Is it C4H8, is it C4H6, C4H10, C3H8, C3H6, questions of that nature. And you're trying to look at butane, buta, for four. And so we have four carbons and just saturating with hydrogens. And the easiest way to remember is I think just to sketch out, um, if you know you have propane, three carbons, and just count the number of hydrogens that you would get to get the maximum of four bonds per carbon. Um, then when we go pentane to decane, it's actually, I think, pretty easy because penta, hexa, hepta, 
octa, nona, deca, those are just telling you how many carbons you have. So pentane is just the C5 hydrocarbon. And the only real question is figuring out how many hydrogens it would have. So pentane would be the C5H. Well, let's think about it. Well, if you remember C4H10, you're probably thinking I'm wedging a CH2 in, so it's going to be C5H12. So that's one way. If you know C4H10, you're just adding another CH2 group. You could think of it this way as well. You can think of it as CH3, CH2's in the middle, CH3 on the end, and I'm going to have three of the CH2's to give me five total carbons. And we can count up the threes on the end, that's six. Three times two in the middle, that's another six, totaling up to 12. I could sketch out five carbons and put three on the ends, two hydrogens in the middle. A lot of different ways I can think of um, sketching out something to count up the number of hydrogens on something like pentane. But just know that the issue is really just being able to come up with the hydrogen count is going to be probably the tricky part. If you're asked for the formula of hexane, it's really just a matter of getting the hydrogen count correct. And so it's going to be 14. Why is it 14? Again, either sketch it out, think of what came before, pentane versus butane versus propane and sketch them all out or just sketch out six carbons in a row and then three on the ends twos in the middle three on the end so it's really simple to come up with a count if you get stuck so it's really not memorization per se and we get all the way up to decane so the c10 and that would be h22 now if you also think about it you have for each carbon has at least two hydrogens, and then the ones at the end have the extra one. So if you think about it, you have 10 times two, so 20, and the extra ones for the end positions. So that's 22. And again, sketch it out if you're not sure, if you forget, or if you wanna just double check. And so octane would be C8H18. Okay, and so we're just using these prefixes here. And so for these compounds, we're making use of the C5 to the, the C10 with this nomenclature system. For this system, we're not using these for the one verse two, verse three, verse four. Notice that, that, that the mono, di, tri, tetra, those aren't helpful or used in the naming of methane through butane. We have a systematic name just for methane, ethane, propane, butane. And then we pick up this nomenclature system from five on forward to 10. Okay, now let's talk about alcohols. So we mentioned alcohols before. I think we talked a little bit about the formula of ethanol. But if you just removed one of the hydrogens and replace it with the, the OH group, um, then you get the alcohol. So methanol is just the CH3OH group. I was wondering if anybody would yell IO, but I guess not. That's fine. Um, it's early. Um, so the uh, ethane should have a hydrogen for ethane. But if you take off a hydrogen, replace it with the hydroxyl group, then that's ethanol. Now you might be wondering, can we replace any of the hydrogens with the hydroxyl group? You can replace any one of the hydrogens on these molecules and come up with these formulas. If you replace a second hydrogen, we have a different molecule. Um, so it technically is still an alcohol, it's just not the simple alcohol. So simple alcohols have one hydroxyl group uh, per molecule. So ethanol, just one hydroxyl. And I could have put it here or here or here and it's the same molecule, as long as I just put one group and leave the others as hydrogens. Now, propanol is kind of interesting in that I could put this hydrogen here or here or any of those positions, but not those two positions. If I put the hydroxyl in the two positions I've X'd out, I actually have a slightly different compound. This is on a later slide, but we would call that two propanol um, and we would call that an isomer. And isomers are <coughs> molecules that have the same formula, but different properties. Um, so just note that you could actually end up with different alcohols depending on the position once you get to three carbons or beyond. The book goes into a numbering system. Don't worry about the numbering system. And I'll have a slide to go back over this in a minute that, that'll show that we're not gonna worry about naming one versus two propanol, but you can conceptually, I think, understand that those are two different molecules. Um, even though I have a slide on it that'll show this structure, let me just sketch out one of them here and just say that if you have this structure here, that this one here is what we would call two propanol or isopropanol and that these are just different compounds. So different meaning they have different melting points, different characteristic properties, different melting points, boiling points, slightly different densities, pretty similar, but not exactly the same. But if I replace the hydroxyl on the same positions, if I go to any of the circled ones, the, those are all one propanols, those are all the same. So I have like six ways I could sketch one propanol and have the same molecule. And I have two ways 
in this structure I could sketch 2-propanol and have among the 1 versus the 2s a bunch of ways of sketching the same molecule. So if we just ask, and really the, the key here is just getting the formula, getting the name versus the formula, formula versus name. That's really the goal of our nomenclature system here. Um, and so if we just said, well, what about hexanol? Well, hopefully we remember that C6H14 would be the formula for hexane. And I'm just replacing one of those hydrogens with the hydroxyl group. So it's as simple as sketching out the formula and replacing one of those hydrogens with the hydroxyl group. Now, you could be thinking, if I have a long chain, the first, if I put on the first carbon, it's going to be the one. If I put on the second, it's going to be the two. If I put on the third, it's going to be the three. And if I think of it from the very end, the end is actually still the one position. But that's what gets complicated, and I don't want us to worry too much about the numbering system for how we name these, the, the one versus two versus three hex and all. But just know that you can still get a bunch of isomers. But really, the key detail is this formula here versus the name hex and all and going back and forth between those two. And I think just seeing the idea that having the hydroxyl group here, one small idea here is that, think about this for a second. If this were an acid, I would have named this acid. You know, like this would have been hexanolic acid or something. But this compound, you can sort of start to appreciate that if this compound behaved like an acid, we would have named it an acid. So just think um, about how when we name things into categories, we're generally putting the things that have that property into the category. So most of the things that don't have the word acid in their name probably aren't acids. There's a huge topic when we get to chapter four where molecules start to look very similar to each other. But if we come back to nomenclature or classifying, we can be like, well, hexanol is not in the category of being an acid, so it must not behave as an acid. And, and so that might help us later down, downstream. So think about the categories we put compounds into are going to be important for us understanding some of their behavior later. Now, this is the slide I was alluding to showing one versus two propanol. And this is actually showing more of their three-dimensional shapes. We get into the 3D shapes in like chapter nine. So don't worry about predicting the three-dimensional shapes. Um, but just worry, I think, only about the fact that there's two different ways we can come up with a formula for C3H7OH. So these all share that formula of not being C3H8 for propane, but replacing one of the hydrogens with the hydroxyl group. And then I like to write the formula C3H7 hydroxyl as opposed to C3H8O and combine the H's just because it kind of really just drives home the point that you have that hydroxyl group on the molecule. You'll see this kind of lingo for writing functional groups pretty commonly in like OCHEM. So we could write CH3, CH2, CH2 hydroxyl to kind of show that hydroxyl in that one position if we wanted to. So there's a lot of ways we will structurally give formulas that kind of try to imply you have a CH3 group, then a CH2, then a CH2, then the hydroxyl. So if you start to see us sequentially writing groups, that's to try to help us understand how those atoms might be connected. But one versus two propanol, um, the, they're just varying on the position of the hydroxyl group. They have different names, but don't worry about coming up with the number in front. Just worry about coming up with C7, C3H7 hydroxyl, and that would be propanol. So we're not going to test you on this numbering system. The book also goes through the, like how if you had pentane, you could have different isomers of pentane. You can arrange the carbons straight chain or not straight chain. Don't worry about that nomenclature as well. Worry about the nomenclature we're setting out here, just the basic formulas of your saturated hydrocarbons. They're alcohols. They're simple alcohols without a numbering system. And then the last category within organic molecules we're going to talk about are carboxylic acids. Um, the most important carboxylic acid for this class is acetic acid. And acetic acid is derived off of the anion acetate because of the ic acid. So the acetate ion, we had two ways of sketching this ion. I mentioned how this way might be slightly more common, commonly used until we get into structure. So this is one way we can sketch the formula for acetate. And so acetic acid, we would just put the H plus in front. So H, C2, H3, O2. That's one way of sketching the formula for acetic acid. And so then it would look something like this. Now that's not very descriptive in terms of like where the hydrogen's connecting to. So if we wanted to be more descriptive of how this molecule actually looks, we might go to the other way of sketching the formula, which was CH3 and then COO minus. And so then if we sketch the formula this way, you can kind of see how the plus and the minus here interact, and then we end up forming this hydroxyl group. And then what this ends up looking like is a CH3 group followed by a carbon double bond to oxygen, 
two long, lone pairs in the O's. And again, I'm not sketching this so that you repeat the sketch, but just so that you can appreciate that there's some connectivity of these atoms. And so then we have the other group. And so this would be one representation of um, the um, um, acetate ion. And we add H plus and we form this molecular bond here. So we get rid of the ions. We don't have an ionic compound. We have a molecular compound. So remember our acids are all molecular compounds, meaning the acid form would form a molecular bond, a covalent bond between the atoms, not really an ionic bond. It's just in water, these things can release ions. So behavior in water leads to that ionization process that we'll describe in more detail in chapter four. And so this molecule here is acetic acid. This is what acetic acid kind of looks like from a structural perspective. Just to give you the idea that this is a carboxylic acid group, that COOH group is what makes this thing behave as an acid. So this is the carboxylic acid group. So we often call like groups of atoms that share a set of properties like the hydroxyl group for alcohols. That's the alcohol functional group. The COOH group is the carboxylic acid functional group that makes something behave as an acid. And so if you just focus on like the hydroxyl part, you might say, well, that, that looks like an alcohol, but it's really important where the alcohol is connected to the C double bond O because that's what be, allows this molecule to behave as an acid. So if you start to recognize COOH, acid, just like the OH group by itself without this, the, the extra CO is just an ordinary alcohol. So it just helps us fit into categories of compounds, alcohols versus carboxylic acids. The acids are the ones that behave as acids and the alcohols are the ones that don't behave as acids. And so the other carboxylic acids would be if you took, instead of like the methyl chain here, what if you had the ethyl chain? So you could have this group here. Let me rewrite this here. So imagine you have CH3, CH2, and then the COOH group. So that would be another version of our carboxylic acid. You could have an even bigger chain. Now, the only thing I would want us to recognize is that in all of these cases that these molecules are acids. These are all, all carboxylic acids. I see that COOH group, I know it's an acidic group. I don't wanna worry about how to name these things. Like, I don't wanna worry about calling this one to be like ethanoic acid, this one would be propionoic acid. Don't worry about that nomenclature. It's in the chapter, but when you get to the section on the actual names of these other compounds other than acetic acid, don't worry about naming those other than just recognizing from their formulas that they have to be acids, just from the recognition of this functional group here, that COOH group. So the main message is that that COOH group, that's an acidic group. We see it, we know that the molecule must be acidic. And to be fair, the recognizing it as an acid is gonna come up more in chapter four, not for like midterm one, but when we get into the next set of material, there's a very, like when we write this question sometimes for midterm four, we always think it's an easy question, but we'll, sh we'll show like CH3OH and just ask, is that an acid? And it's not an acid. You don't name it as an acid. It doesn't have the COOH group. It's called methanol. So that's like not an acid. It's like such a chapter two concept in my opinion. We'll ask it later when we start talking about what really makes something behave as an acid in water. We'll talk about what that means. Then you circle back to a compound like this and everyone starts seeing the hydroxyl group and it looks like a base because we start to learn bases are OH minus. It doesn't release OH minus in water. Acids release H plus. This thing doesn't really release H plus ions in water either. So, you know, if we come back to chapter two, it's not in the acid category. It's in the alcohol category. If it were an acid, we would have named it as an acid. So, so recognizing functional groups, recognizing categories is really a big aspect of naming where our tests on this chapter is really just gonna be like I keep saying, name to formula, formula to name. Kind of recognizing how we just name these things is the main goal for chapter two, but downstream is the recognition of the different categories that if we know something's ionic, it's gonna have a different set of properties than if it's molecular. And the simple difference is molecular compounds are compounds that have all non-metallic elements. So hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the hydrogen plus the right side elements. And then the um, ionic compounds are the metals mixed with non-metals. It's the cations mixed with anions. Okay, so let's name some other uh, inorganic compounds. And I think this is actually the last category because it's to me, it's like kind of a catch-all because there's like one set of compounds that we haven't yet been able to name. If we looked at things like CCL4, N2O, P2O5, we mentioned CO versus CO2. So we have compounds like this that we already knew the names of, 
But if you think of the systems that we've learned so far, these molecules aren't ionic, they're molecular, so they don't fit into any kind of ionic nomenclature system. Uh, they're not alcohols, they're not hydrocarbons. You know, so how do we name these compounds? Well, we call these compounds um, binary molecular compounds. Now, let's come back to another binary molecular compound real quick. CH4 is binary, but it fits into a better category than being the binary molecular compound. So think of this category here as being the compounds we haven't yet been able to name by some other category. So the names and formulas of binary molecular compounds, the way we name these is generally the element further to the left in the periodic table tends to be given first with the formula. But that's not always the case, but it's usually the case. So for example, carbon's more to the left, so carbon's written before the oxygen. Now, in terms of the way we uh, name these compounds, we're going to name that first element first. We're going to name carbon first, then the second element. So if we give you the name, you know carbon's first because it goes carbon monoxide. So you know carbon's first. And if you look in the periodic table, or if you just look at the, the name CO, that's why it's CO, not OC. So sometimes you might wonder, why is it CO versus OC? It's CO just because carbon is more to the left. We tend to give the leftmost element first. And so same thing for CO2. And then we name the, that first element first in the name. So we go carbon for these two compounds because the element first in the formula is carbon. And then we give the second element with the IDE suffix, so oxide for the, for the CO for CO2. But then we're going to use the prefixes to indicate the quantity of the elements present, um, including mono, except for when it's the first element. So here we use the full chart of mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, et cetera, from that previous slide on naming hydrocarbons. So we use mono, just not for the first. So we go carbon monoxide. Now you might wonder why carbon monoxide versus carbon monoxide. There's a lot of like um, um, grammar that's done on these names to shorten the name so it's phonetically easy to say. Again, not a spelling class, so you're not going to see monoxide versus monoxide as choices. So you may see that we combine some syllables or, or some letters just to make these words easier to say. And then for carbon with two, it's just di from our chart, so dioxide for carbon dioxide. So all we're really remembering here is mono, di, tri, tetra, and then pentahexa, the, the sides of an octagon down to 10, all the way up to 10. Now, we could go carbon... Uh, tetrahydride, but again, methane is going to be the better name here. So you kind of think, is there a better name than the system of this binary system? So if I said name CH4 as if it were a binary compound in the system name, you would say carbon tetrahydride, but we have a better name for it of just methane. And then there are some compounds like CCL4 down here that we can name. And so again, we're not going monocarbon. We don't need to put mono for the first. If we had two of the first, we would use the dye. We just don't use the mono for the first. So this would be carbon. What do you guys think now? So we got four, so tetra chloride. And then we just go IDE ending instead of the, the element ending of, of chlorine. So instead of tetrachlorine, tetrachloride. And it doesn't mean that these compounds are ionic, so calling it chloride doesn't mean that it's carbon four plus chloride with minus charges. This molecule would look something like this, where we have those covalent bonds linking the atoms. Just really showing you, and really just trying to get us to think of the difference between a molecular compound versus an ionic compound. You see the chloride, you might think it's ionic from the name, but it's not ionic. It's a molecular compound. N2O, dinitrogen. monoxide. So I do use di, tri, tetra for the first atom, just not mono. Now sometimes there are more common names that, that, that an, a compound has, but I, I don't want you to worry about knowing that common name. Like this is actually nitrous oxide by its common name. If you were to like buy or look for this gas in like a cylinder, that's the name you would see, but we'll just go di nitrogen monoxide for what I want you to know. Yes. Well, I mean, I, the way I would tend to think of it, I would look at a compound and just think, is there some other system I know how to name it in? 
And if not, it's, and there's two elements present. So the binary is two elements total. And then I would also say with the caveat that it's molecular and then also not in a category we already know how to name. And then I think in terms of recognizing inorganic versus organic, I wouldn't worry so much about that. I would just think of it as being like, um, th th that's just the section name of 2.8 where these compounds are named. But I think that this naming system is what we use for where you don't have metal, non-metal, because those fit into the ionic nomenclature. So the only thing left are molecular compounds that aren't methane or um, things that we already know how to name. And also, if you, if you think of it, I, like if you look at the way the book's laid out, this naming system comes up before methane comes up in the next section. So that's why I cover the next section and circle back. Because to me, this category is a catch-all. And once we look at some, some names, once we finish this, this slide, once we start looking at compounds, the first thought is going to be categorizing what it is, and that'll hopefully help us name. P2O5, didn't save enough room, let me write it down here. So that would be diphosphorus. And then penta is often just pentoxide, but if you called it penta oxide, that's fine. And again, not a spelling class, so you don't have to worry about that little nuance, but you'll see this name a lot where they just combine the, the two vowels to make pentoxide. But if you're writing penta oxide, that's totally fine for this five oxide ion. Yeah, so, okay, so, so empirical versus molecular. For these compounds, you will see things exist like N2O4 versus NO2 as two different molecules. And so we'll want to name like N2O still, like so when you see anything but an ionic compound, ionic compounds, and there's almost a small caveat I can talk about, but ionic compounds are the simplest ratio because that's the only compound that's possible. When you get into molecular compounds, like if you notice like C4H10 is not an empirical formula. But the formula, the molecular formula is what's really important. The C4H10 is really, really important for C4H10. The empirical formula doesn't matter almost at all for these molecular compounds. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, you could look at a compound, like if we said N2O4 is dinitrogen tetraoxide or tetroxide, that the empirical formula being NO2, nitrogen dioxide, would almost just be like a footnote or almost irrelevant to the name of N2O4 and its properties. So like, just think for molecular compounds, you can have like, the, that specific collection of atoms exists as like one specific group that can exist. And if you imagine, let's say the thing's a gas, you have another particle right next to it that has the same formula. With ions, it's a little different. It's, it, these are all gonna be solid compounds. Your ionic compounds all just alternate with their charges. There's some geometry there that's relevant, but not to this discussion, just where you're thinking alternating plus minuses in like, almost like an array of atoms. Uh, where you don't have a distinct like unit like you do within molecular compounds. This is a really big sticking point, I think, of just like picturing CH4 as one thing and another CH4 as another, versus NaCl being NaCl, NAC, so Na plus Cl minus, Na plus Cl minus, and repeating in three dimensions like a big array. And that you never really have an NaCl, one Na and one chloride that's separate from the others. Okay, um, the last one here, I, and I just had this here as kind of like a reminder that CRO3, we don't go back and rename this chromium trioxide because it's not a molecular compound. This is ionic. So CRO3, we name it for being ionic. And so we have to look at oxide being a two minus here. This is an ion. We have three of them, six minus. So I have a six plus chromium. So I go back to my ionic compound nomenclature system. So I call this chromium uh, six oxide, not chromium trioxide. So just remember the nomenclature system on this page is for molecular compounds. This one's ionic, so I name it for being ionic. Cation followed by anion name. Now, one last thing, CRO3, this also is another example of why I wouldn't do this approach here. The cross multiplying might work if you do this approach here from the charges down to the units, but then you want to simplify to this, the, the simplest whole number ratio. 
But when they're both even, you don't have to do that. When they're both even, you see two plus and a six plus, or two minus and a six plus, you can be like, well, I have three to one. So when they're both even or they're both odd, you probably don't have to worry about, you can just do the math easily without cross multiplying. I cross multiply when I have like a two plus and a three minus. When I have even odd, it just gives me a really easy way to get my coefficients. And I just wanna point out that going from the coefficients, or excuse me, going from the subscripts back to the charges, I would almost never cross multiply back. So when I think of cross multiplying, it might be from the charges downward to the subscripts, but not backwards. I wanna think, what is the charge of oxide? That's what gets me into the proper charge of chromium. So this two minus being my starting point is the key detail. So I have to start there or I'm never gonna get this right. So I have to think, what do I know the charge of in CrO3? It's the oxygen has a two minus charge from its periodic table placement. Okay, so a bunch of examples here and probably with the remaining time, I'll just be coming up with other examples that kind of fit into um, our discussion here that really help us just look at a, a formula, and some of these we've maybe named every now and then I come up with a slide and I don't realize that it was a later example. We already named sodium hypochlorite earlier, but I think the most important part for like where we're at now is making sure that the first thought is that that's an ionic compound. And it's an ionic compound because I see metal and I see a collection of non-metallic things like chlorine's a non-metal, sodium's a metal, so this has to be an ionic compound. And so then I just start thinking of what should I know? The key detail, like we mentioned earlier, is that that's chlorate. So two would be chlorite. So no oxygens is hypochlorite. So that being NaClO. And again, we did this one just a little bit ago. So going through that one fast. Iron three acetate. And so for this compound here, for acetate, again, it kind of becomes a question of what formula makes more sense. I think the C2H3O2 for the most part makes more sense. It, it, maybe when we get to the acids, it makes more sense to write it explicitly out as CH3COO minus. But I really like writing it this way for nomenclature here for iron three plus, because it really gets me just to make sure I see acetate has a minus charge. That's just something I have to know. Acetate, the C2H3O2 has a one minus charge. And so iron three plus is Fe three plus. So I need three of the acetate ions. Of course, this is an ionic compound as well, just to make sure we're thinking of the ionic compound nomenclature system. But so I would have Fe C2 H3O2 3. And I just like to make sure I don't include the charges. The charges don't go into the formula, of course. So I'm just kind of lassoing out what we'd express as the formula. So when I see perchloric acid, I mean, acids are easy, right? Because like, you know it's an acid. Like, so this is fitting right into the acid naming system because we see the name acid. And then downstream, this is going to behave as an acid. And the things I don't call acids aren't going to behave as acids because if they did, I would have named them as acids. So you have to think of this like circular, it's totally circular logics, but it's an important circular logics. It's a logic that when we wrote the book, we included this very purposefully. So just know the things in the acid category behave as acids later when we talk about acids. And things that don't get named as acids don't behave as acids. But so think of what ion perchloric acid was named after, or the anion it's related to, or complementary to is another name we sometimes use. So what do you guys think it would be related to? Probably whatever has the name perchlorate, right? So what ion has the formula perchlorate? Well, again, ClO3 minus is chlorate, so it's not ClO3 minus, but if I add an O and go up a count, then that's when the per comes in. So the per means I added an O to chlorate. So if I only memorize chlorate and I only memorize adding an O to the formula kicks the per prefix in, then I know that per chlorate is ClO4 minus. And so I'm just dealing with the per chlorate ion here. And then an acid form, which just takes one H plus to neutralize the charge. So I'd have HClO4. This is actually a very nasty acid to work with. If you come across this in the lab, I don't know what careers you guys are gonna end up having. Sometimes you end up doing research and you see a procedure that calls for this and you start mixing things together because you know, like, let's say you're a grad student in some sort of a lab, you know what chemicals are, you can mix them together. This is a very hazardous acid, so you have to be very, very careful working with um, compounds. And I just really like to stress that there's some compounds that are so nasty that can be so dangerous and, and sometimes just us knowing and recognizing them gives us a sense of security. And I want you to make sure that anytime you actually 
do research or if you get into a lab and you're like, say, like a grad student working with these compounds, make sure you know with what, what you're working with um, before, um, before you do so. So again, for nitric acid, again, it's an acid. So the recognizing acids from the name is really easy because the name, acid's in the name. So that's helpful. And so it's just going to be the acid derived off of the eight. So the ic acid just tells me that the name has to be derived off of nitrate, which is NO3 minus. And so that's going to be H plus NO3 minus, so HNO3. Now, sometimes when I write the H plus and the nitrate combining, they combine and then they stick together and they don't release. And sometimes that makes, makes it confusing that it makes it seem as if nitrate would be ionic, but we call it a molecular compound. Now, here's a big distinction. Na plus, Cl minus combined, they stay as ions. The H plus and the nitrate hit each other. The hydrogen, it forms that chemical bond with one of the oxygens of nitrate, and it forms a covalent bond. A big difference is nitrate's boiling point and melting point really low. Sodium chloride's really high. So they really have a vastly different set of properties. And so in terms of molecular versus ionic, our acids here, these are molecular compounds. Even though they have these underlying ions, even though they can release ions in certain circumstances, but when we look at the formula, that the, the molecule can be intact with covalent bonds throughout the structure, not ionic bonds. So we did this one earlier, H2SO3, that would be the ion of sulfite, and ites go to OUS, so this is sulfurous acid. So sulfur, OUS acid. And again, the recognizing this as an acid to me comes from kind of seeing what looks like an anion I, I know how to name with H pluses added out in front. And the H pluses are almost always in front except for that weird formula for acetic acid. So in every acid that we've named so far, you're gonna see H or H2 or H3, depending on the charge of the anion out front, and then the anion second. So you're gonna see like H3, PO4, H2, SO3, H2, SO4. And then with the, H, uh, with the acetate being the C2H3O2, you can write the H first. So H, C2, H3O2. So generally you're seeing an H out in front, then an anion you know how to name. And then just acetic acid, we could put the hydrogen at the end too in a different way of descriptively writing the formula. H2S, no, as an acid. The reason why I say as an acid is because it's really not that acidic and it's really not that common to actually name it this way. H2S is actually a gas at room temperature. If you had it in solution, it would bubble away and smell like rotten eggs because it's the rotten egg smell, or it's the, it's the chemical in rotten eggs that gives it that distinct odor. Um, and so this is actually a gas at room temperature that you would probably call hydrogen sulfide if you were naming it by its common name. But if you were to say, well, if it's behaving in water like an acid, you're thinking sulfide. So here you're thinking sulfide ion, and then as an acid, it would be hydrosulfuric acid. So just like hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic sulfide, the ides go to hydrosulfuric acid. Probably not the most common acid to name. Um, and let me also finish the name. So hydrosulfuric acid. So these are also molecular compounds. Also an acid, obviously, because we're naming it in the category of being an acid. So hydrosulfuric acid, named off of sulfide. N2O4 for dinitrogen tetra or tetroxide. So if we forget hexane, hopefully the obvious thing is six. I don't know how we could forget six, to be honest, but but hopefully that's the key details. Remembering hexane would have six carbons and then CH3 is on the end and then CH2 is in the middle. And so that's going to give me C6H14. So I'm gonna have C6H12 plus the extra two for the CH3s on the end. Decanol, C, or dec, decane's the C10. So replace one of the hydrogens with the hydroxyl group. So C10, H21, hydroxyl. So the key detail, I think, for these is here we're going binary molecular compound. It's so still a molecular compound, but I'm going binary. 
because it's not an acid, not a hydrocarbon, not an alcohol, not an ionic compound. The only category left is that binary category. Hexane, hydrocarbon, still a molecular compound. Decanol, also a molecular compound. So all of the compounds below the first two examples here are molecular compounds. And so just being able to categorize a compound and think of what category it's in is going to, I think, really help us just be able to uh, name the compound. The, um, one of the things, like, like I used to, to, to think of, like, is you can name water a bunch of ways. So, like, name water if it were, um, like, uh, an alcohol. You can call it hydrogenol. Because, like, you can think of H2 as hydrogen, and you replace hydrogen with the hydroxyl group. If you name this like an alcohol, you probably would have said hydrogenol. You could call it dihydrogen monoxide if you name it for being a binary compound. So you can think of a compound could be named a bunch of different ways, even though we just, of course, call this water. Um, let's maybe go through um, a couple last examples, just on maybe coming up with charge, maybe a couple ions we haven't seen um, that often. What about um, barium hydroxide? So the hydroxide ion is the hydroxyl, the OH minus ion. Barium's a two plus. So we just have two of the hydroxide ions. So BaOH2 for barium hydroxide. Um, so in terms of carbonate, nitrate, so, so what do we want you to know this way is you know, that we have carbonate, CO3 with a two minus, nitrogen's three with a minus, but phosphorus is four with a three minus. Sulfur is four with a two minus, and then uh, chlorine is three with a minus. And so those are all the eights. So that's carbonate, nitrogen, so nitrate. That's phosphor, so phosphate, sulfate, chlorate. And then if you take an O away, they would all be the ites. And so if you see a compound like um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Let, let's do MN. with SO3, let's do this five, and let's do this two. So what's the name of this? And we'll just end with this one here today. So how do we name that compound? MN2 SO3 five. Well, think of the charge of SO3, how from sulfate's a two minus, SO3 is a two minus. So that's our starting point. Like that's the key detail I have to know because that's what allows me to know I have a 10 minus from the five of them collectively telling me that the two manganese ions share a total of plus 10. From the plus 10, I get that each manganese is a plus five. And so that's the whole process of being able to take the, from the charge of the one, how many of it that there are, gives me the total collective charge for the cations. There's two of them, so they share a plus five. I could have done this, but that only works when it works. You know, like that only works if, if this charge is right. And it's not always going to be right. You know, so, so I really think you have to start with the 2 minus here to work to the total collective charge of 10 minus to get to the 10 plus. So now once we deduce the charge of manganese, like that's the key detail is we have to get that right. So when we're looking at manganese, that we can get the Roman numeral right. So we call that manganese 5. So just know that this here is just a charge. So that's just that charge of five plus manganese five. And then what's the ion name? Sulfite. So that'd be manganese five sulfite for that ion there. Okay, so Monday I'll be here at 7.15 for anybody who wants to come early. I'll record that. So if you don't get here early, that's fine. But I'll do some review Q and A for any questions you guys have, bring them in. I'll, we'll talk about it. I'll have some review problems if you don't have questions. And then we'll start lecture up as normal at 8 o'clock. All right, guys, have a great weekend.